there were many, many Mondays when it was just me or it was me and one other person and we were different pace groups. So it was really awkward. We were running back and forth. But people tend to focus on the end result. But I will also say that journey of knowing when things are really tough and that nothing is necessarily guaranteed, that has made me even stronger along the way. This is Running For Real, the podcast for runners who know that for every runner's high, there are just as many lows. All those just missed PRs, easy runs that feel hard, injury blues, and more. Each week, we'll talk to running, health, and wellness experts about their highs, lows, and best advice to build our confidence. Running For Real is about being honest, being brave, and most of all, not feeling alone. And now here's our host, Tina Muir. Hello, my friends. Welcome to episode 181 of the Running For Real podcast. Thank you so much for joining me today. If you are a first time listener, if you are a massive Allison fan, welcome. I'm excited you are here. Hope you continue to stay. Subscribe and join us and then come find me. Uh, you can find me across social media at either Tina Muir 88 on Instagram, Tina Muir on Twitter or um, facebook.com forward slash real Tina Muir. My name is spelled T-I-N-A-M-U-I-R, if that helps. Although I do say M-U-I-R. Those of you who are um, regular listeners probably are used to that by now, but you wouldn't believe the amount of times when I try and spell my name, people say M-U-I-O, M-U-I-L, come up with all kinds of different ways, but it's M-U-I-R. So just want to clarify that for a second there. So last week on the show, we had the one and only Meb Kofleski. I was excited to record that first ever like official episode of him on my show, which seems crazy because we're at 181 today. But uh, I had have had him on on a uh, bonus show that was hosted at the New York Road Runners. But this was the first time I've had him really on the show um, on his own. And honestly, part of that was choice. I hadn't ever really pursued Meb that hard and a lot of that was because um I felt like he had shared a lot of his story you know he he was doing the rounds and and I really like to keep these conversations different and try and really think hard about what I want to interview people uh, to ask them so uh, I wanted to wait until there was a time when I had felt like I had something that was different I could talk to about Meb uh talk to Meb about I should say So I hope you enjoyed that episode with Meb last week. If not, go back and listen to it. And now today, I am really excited for you to meet my guest today. She is a wonderful person. She is someone who is really making massive waves within the running community and what she is helping to build community. She's bringing people in. She's making uh, the running world just a whole lot more inclusive. And I'm really excited for you to meet Alison Desir, who we are going to meet in just a second. This was a really um, nerve wracking interview for me, not so much the conversation. I love the conversation, but uh, she did have her son with her the whole time, her seven month old son. And uh, I was very scared that he was going to wake up and we'd have to cut the interview or not even wake up. He was going to be like crying or screaming because seven month olds, you never know. Um, But he didn't. He was a real trooper. So you got the whole episode. Um, It's a wonderful conversation. I just want to take a moment to thank Athletic Greens and Janji as the sponsors for this episode. And then we will be right to the episode. Thank you to Athletic Greens for sponsoring this episode of the Running Thrill podcast. By now, you know, I am a big fan of Athletic Greens. The ultimate daily is the all-in-one supplement with 75 vitamins, minerals and whole food sourced ingredients that work together to help the body absorb and synthesize these nutrients in a highly bioavailable form. It was originally developed for athletes and high performers. Just one scoop uh, of Ultimate Daily delivers adaptogens, antioxidants, prebiotics, probiotics and a superfood complex that helps support the body's nutritional needs. And I have found it just to be a wonderful addition to my life. I wake up first thing in the morning, I do, I stumble into the kitchen, I pour water into my shaker, um, mix the scoop of Athletic Greens in there and drink it down while I write in my journal. Life changing, gets me off on the right foot. I know I've got, you know, uh, my safety net of nutrition going in every day, even if my diet hasn't been the best, particularly during pregnancy. Um, But it has been just a great thing. Uh, It's taken by elite, it's taken by professionals, 
professionals, health conscious go-getters. It makes it so easy for you to get this comprehensive nutrition without the need for multiple pills, powders or complex routines. It really is the most complete supplement for a better you. Uh, it has the antioxidant equivalent of 12 servings of fruits and vegetable in every scoop. And I know that I'm getting these hard to find ingredients and a high level of antioxidants that can boost my immunity. Uh, Bailey and Steve both recently got the flu and I honestly think a big part of how I somehow managed to not get it was because of athletic greens. I genuinely believe that. Now, my friends, you can get a 20 serving travel pack for free. That's worth $79 by going to athleticgreens.com forward slash Tina. That's athleticgreens.com forward slash Tina. And you will be able to get that 20 serving $79 value pack for free. And with these big races we have coming up, you do not want to be leaving this to chance. It feels horrible if you wake up the week of the race with sickness. Get this in your system so that it's ready. It's helping protect you. So when race day comes, you are ready to go. I believe in it so much and I hope you do too. Alison, I am so excited to have you here on the Running For Real podcast. We are really tempting fate right now. Um, yes. And um, our listeners, you can explain to them why that will be in just a second. But thank you so much for being here. Thank you so much for the opportunity. I'm, uh, I'm here with my seven-month-old son who has his first little tooth about to pop out. So any moment, there could be screams. <laughs> yep. Okay, so that's a heads up for anyone listening. If that happens, we will kind of pause and regroup and decide what we're doing but um for now we're gonna hope that he stays asleep but those of you who have kids know that we are definitely taking a risk here so all right so let's jump straight into it yeah you are the founder of many things um yes. harlem run run for all women global women do you say global women run collective yes exactly. i didn't know there's an x in there so i wasn't sure yeah. um And, you know, that is a lot for any person, let alone being a mother as well. Um, But I want to kind of go through, I'll go through each of those uh, in a little while. But for now, I want to start with your running journey. Mm -hmm. Running kind of came into your life when you were in a dark place. So maybe tell us about how running, you know, first kind of, I guess, suckered you in. And now you're, you're so in that you're creating all these amazing things to, to help other runners. So tell us about your, your start. I started running distance about seven years ago. I had been going through a period of depression and um, I had lost my job. The person who I was dating at the time was cheating on me. My father was sick with Lewy body dementia and I really wasn't leaving my bed. I would just stay in bed all day long, um, scrolling through social media. And I just happened to see that one of my friends at the time was training for a marathon. And as we all do, he was sharing his every run and experience on social (laughs) media. And, uh, it really struck me because he was not your typical marathon runner. He wasn't like a skinny white guy. He was this like six foot tall, 200 pound black guy in a fraternity. And he was talking about how it was new and exciting for him. And that really struck me because I thought to myself, if this guy can do it, like he's not even an athlete, quote unquote, he's never done this before. If he can do it, maybe I can do it. And maybe I can achieve the same sort of results in in terms of feeling good about myself. Um, I let the yes, the the rest of the year go by. And then it was January and, you know, everybody's thinking new year, new me. And I was like, let me just, right. Let me just try this. So I remember going to the leukemia and lymphoma society office and signing up for a marathon in exchange for, uh, fundraising for the organization. And that really changed the whole trajectory of my life. I, uh, found myself becoming more confident. I was actually leaving the house because I had to train, I was meeting up with folks. So I began to have this community of people around me and I, I managed to raise over $5,000 for the organization. And I realized that running was not just about like getting out there and pounding the pavement, but it was about the people that you connect with. It was about raising money for causes. And that sort of made me want to share that with more folks who look like me, because one thing that stuck out to me again was that as I was crossing the finish line throughout the race, there weren't a lot of women of color, a lot of black women. Um, so about six months after that, I started Harlem run and it's funny now to think about oh, like, so it was said, really like really soon into your own running journey. Exactly. Yeah. I was like, I gotta, I mean, that's the kind of person that I am though. Right. Like I'm like, I found something good. I'm going to tell everybody about it. But what's funny about with Harlem run, uh, I started six months later and nobody showed up for like four months. Mm-hmm. So it really was just me out there like posting, pretending people were with me. 
and and hoping that somebody would finally show up, which which finally did happen. Yeah, and I definitely want to um, get on to talk about that because um, I think that is a very important um, thing to to bring up. Um, but you know, in those early days of running, just you, you know, getting you getting out there in those you know first few months before this uh, even Harlem Run came into your mind. What did you learn about running? Like, did, was there any kind of like, oh, I, huh, I see what people are talking about. Were you very much in the kind of um, the surface things that most runners tend to be in for a while about like, you know, this is helping me control my weight. It's making me, uh, I like the endorphin rush, the runner's high. Like, what was your experience in those early months? For me, it wasn't, it was really recognizing that this time was time that I had complete control of my life because I felt very much like nothing was within my control. My father was, um, Lewy body dementia is a degenerative disease. So, you know, day by day, week by week, he would lose another thing, whether it was his ability to speak, his ability to walk, to eat. So that was out of my control. I couldn't find a job that was out of my control. But I felt like when I went out for a run, I I could control the exact time that I was going to be out. I could control the mileage, um, the speed. And so it really felt like, wow, like I, I actually can do something and can, you know, control my environment. And then I put an X amount and I get X results. Like I also really like that if you do, you know, within reason, but if you do speed work, you get faster, right? If you continue to run long, you have, you build up endurance. So that's really what struck me. Yeah, no, that's very interesting. And and what about like, did you feel any any judgment or, you know, you mentioned that you felt like there weren't really many people that looked like you. Did you feel it from either direction? Like, you know, kind of that you were being judged for being out there or that people who, you know, people of color maybe were thinking like, oh, what is she doing? Like, that's not for us. Um, mm-hmm. Did you fi- Did you find any judgment either way? Um, you know, initially I wasn't, uh, when I started with team and training, I wasn't even, I mean, I knew that I was one of the only people out there, but I was so caught up in my own depression and anxiety, my own stuff. It was really just about like, wow, look what I can do with my body. I think as it became, um, I mean, never really, but running is never necessarily fun. I don't know if that's the word, like it's enjoyable. Um, but as I got better at it, uh, then I that's when I think, um, the awareness started to hit like, Oh, wait a second. Like who's around me and, um, where are the other folks like me? And other than the East Africans who are winning, right? Like where are the, the people of color? Yeah. And did, did you have trouble then convincing you said about, you know, no one showing up to Harlem run for a while and we'll go into that in a second, but did you have trouble convincing other people to start running? Cause they're like, Oh no, no, that's not for me. Well, you know, at the beginning, it was just that the only running friends that I had were the friends who I was training for this first marathon okay. with. Um, but one of my best friends, Sean Peters, he actually like, he was the one, even though I was showing up by myself basically for four months, but every now and then he would come and show up. And I think it was more that, um, I just didn't have that friendship circle. Now, all of my friends, my previous friends have started running and most of my friends are running. Um, but it was really the reaction of folks on the street. Like now it's very different in New York. There's run clubs, run crews on every single corner, but I would run down the street and people would be like, there's that runner girl. Like, what are you running from? What are you doing? Mm. And those were, um, that's what it was in in the early days. And, and the people who, you know, even though it took four months, I would get, uh, when people finally did show up, they would say, oh, we wanted to make sure that there were enough paces for us that I wouldn't be left behind. So there definitely was and is a lot of insecurity about like, do I fit in? Can I do this? Absolutely. And I think that kind of goes across the board, doesn't it? Um, you know, we hear this time and time again about, um, people being, you know, either scared or feeling uncomfortable about going to a pace groups because they don't want to be the one that everyone's waiting for or the one left behind. And, and I, you know, it totally makes sense. Um, if I was going to go on a training run with, a, if a group of Olympians invited me along, I'd be like, oh, I, I think I'm, I think I'm busy, you know, cause you wouldn't want to be that. You would, you always have that fear, don't you? So, um, exactly. yeah. So uh, thank you for, for sharing that. So let's talk here yeah, about Harlem run. Um, you started it, it as a place to find community. Yeah. Um, and you said for 12 weeks, no one showed up. Yes. How did that feel? I mean, you know, you obviously know you're starting something new. You can, you can tell yourself logically, okay, this is new. People don't know. It just takes time. But how, you know, having been through depression or coming out of the other side of this, was that hard for you to mentally kind of handle? Like, look, I'm really putting myself out here and no one's, 
No one's even, you know, giving it a try. Absolutely. I Now when I reflect on it, I'm like, how did I do that? And would I still do that today? Right. I think it was like, it was really, it was really sad, honestly. And if it weren't for my mother, I would call my mother every week and my mother would say something like, if you build it, they will come. Like mm-hmm. people are watching and they want to make sure that you're consistent and that you're there and eventually they'll show up. But it was really disheartening because I felt like I had this grand plan and this big idea. And if only people would just show up and, you know, week by week, it, it started to wear on me. So I was thankful when the first person showed up, like, and when that person, you know, I think about there's this video of, um, like this guy who's dancing on a hill and he looks really crazy. And then suddenly somebody jumps in and then all of a sudden, like there's a hundred people, right. So it takes that first follower to really get things going. So when that first person came, like I stuck to them, like white on rice, (laughs) we are doing this thing together. (laughs) Yeah. Well, I'm so glad to hear that because I think that's, um, something that's very common and Okay. All right. <laughs> okay, friends, we um we do have an awake baby and we're gonna keep going. So hopefully this is gonna um <laughs> we'll be able to continue this conversation. But this is mum life. This is how things go. Um <laughs> and so we're we're gonna we're gonna carry on with the conversation as best we can here. All right. So you know, going on from there, um someone who's in a similar position maybe they're trying to start something. Um, and you mentioned 12 weeks. That's quite a lot of time to, to stick in it. I feel, I don't know, honestly, if I would have abandoned ship and been like, you know what, this isn't working. Um, but you, you know, you persevered, you stuck through it. That shows a lot about your character, but someone who is in that stage, they're trying to do something. It doesn't have to be running related, but they're trying to do something, make a difference. And it just feels like they're not getting any traction. And as you said, perfectly, that video where someone just takes one person to join in and then there's a hundred, but we see those videos and we think, well, that's how it's supposed to work. Right. But then you don't see, yeah, like you said, the 12 weeks of waiting to get to that point. So what would you say? Yeah. I mean, and, and also to add on that, it wasn't like, you know, people started coming and then all of a sudden, like it's, it's beautiful and it's perfect and everything keeps going in a, in an upward progression, right? Like there were still weeks when very few people came out. There was still a lot of weeks of self-doubt. And I think for me, like when I reflect on that and when I think about the stuff that I've done since then, I think it really was rooted in my why and knowing the reason why I was showing up, right? Like I, I, and and maybe because I was, I'm a little self-absorbed, right? Like I'm so important. I need to share this with the world, but I knew that it had literally running had literally saved my life. And I really felt like there was a need for it and that, you know, folks will really enjoy this space when they show up. Mm -hmm. But yeah, somebody actually reached out to me on Instagram. Um, when I posted, I shared that story again and they were like, Oh my God, no way. Like I thought I was doing it wrong. And it's like, that's, you know, social media is a beautiful thing, but it's also, like we show for the most part, our highlight reel. Like when you see a hundred people showing up at Harlem run, know that there were many, many Mondays when it was just me or it was me and one other person. And we were different pace groups. So it was really awkward. We were running back and forth. So, you know, you, people tend to focus on the end result, but I will also say that journey of knowing when things are really tough and that nothing is necessarily guaranteed that has made me even stronger along the way. Yes, I love that. I think that's so true. And it's it's so hard for us to, I mean, we always jump to, it's me. Um, right. Like, you know, we forget that people have busy lives and we ourselves do it, don't we? We, you know, you have something on the calendar and you're like, oh, you know, I really have been meaning to go to that, but I just got too much going on right now. But then totally. when you're the person waiting, it feels like, well, of course they didn't show up because it's me, you know, like I'm not worth it. Yeah. Yes. And particularly like you highlighted this before coming from my journey of depression and anxiety, of course, like I I kept centering myself and everything too, right? Like if only I had better flyers, if only people liked me more, if only, and then, you know, you start to think about, like you said, how busy life is, how now I have a child, right? I can't tell you the amount of times I say I'm going to do something and then I just can't, you know? Uh And really, this is number three, trying (laughs) to third attempt. (laughs) Yeah. God, yeah. So, you know, and, and that also makes me really thankful, like the people who show up, even if it's just one, but the hundred people who show up on a Monday or a Thursday, that's how important this space is to them, right? Like there's a million places they could be. Their lives are so complicated, but particularly in a city like New York, which can be so lonely, um, it's an important place for connection. Yes. I love that. Thank you so much for sharing that. All right. So now it's become, you know, so much more than just a a group to run. It represents so much. And and like you said, has really, really grown. Um, So, 
you mentioned about this this world that we live in and 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 one of the good things is one of the good things about it we've mentioned one of the bad is that it brings people to you connects you with people who you would otherwise never have known you know right. might be a physical group like you've got Harlem Run um I have an online community superstars you guys I know are very connected in there so from there tell us about you know you you decided Harlem Run wasn't enough um <laughs> you wanted to do more um and you, as far as I can research, the next part of your journey was to make a, a big stand, which was running from New York to Washington, D.C. for the Women's March yes. as a show of resilience, which became yeah. Run for All Women. So tell us about that decision, where that came along and yes. um, yeah, why why that? Yeah, absolutely. So it's it's funny and um, I should know, right, none of this is possible without all of like the support that I have, including my husband. He was one of the very first people who showed up to Harlem mm-hmm. Run um, back in the early him? days. No, I didn't know oh, him. We met through social met- media. Oh, oh, that's so Exactly. Cool. Wow. I'm waiting for Instagram to like sponsor us, <laughs> sponsor our love story. So but cool. um, yeah, so he was one of the very first people and, and Harlem Run, we have 10 other leaders that help lead the group. And, and truly like nothing that I've done is, is possible without the team and all of us working together, but run for all women came along, not as an intentional, like, let me start another thing. Um, but it was really reflecting on after the election. And again, it was a new year coming, right? The election results came in and, and new year was on the horizon. And I was thinking about how can I leverage my community? How can I do something, um, to, sort of make up for the fact that I felt like I didn't do enough during the election cycle. Right. Like I think a part of me now reflecting, I guess all the signs were there that Trump would be elected, but he, you know, holding out hope that (laughs) democracy would prevail. Um, and so I just felt like, okay, I need to do something. I have this amazing community. We're all so, um, committed to social causes. How can I organize and get to the women's March? So came up with this idea to, um, run from Harlem to Washington, DC and to fundraise for Planned Parenthood, recognizing that Planned Parenthood would and continues to, to come under attack under the administration. And it started off as this very small idea that I shared with a friend and, um, to Talisa is her name. She is one of, she at the time was one of the only black ultra marathoners that I knew. So I reached out to her and I was like, is this possible? Like if we split up the mileage, we take five days to do it. We rest in between, like, are you down? And she said, yes. And if she hadn't said yes, then this never would have come to be. Mm. Um, but, uh, it, it actually ended up morphing very quickly after putting out the idea, it went viral and, Lots of women started reaching out, women and men started reaching out saying that they wanted to be involved. And, um, Mary Arnold, who's a very good friend of mine and now owns her own consulting business, active brand consulting was like, let me help you out. Let's convert this into an overnight relay so that we can get as much participation as possible. People can sign up for four mile legs and they can meet us along the way. And, um, that's what happened. We, we took off from my apartment building on, uh, 145th and Lennox, because it was supposed to be just a few of us initially, (laughs) 300 people showed up and we left the evening of January 18th. And every four miles, people were meeting us to run with us, to give us coffee. There were cheer stations all the way down to DC. And I'm telling the story very quickly, but, um, it was, it was nothing short of amazing. We raised Mm -hmm. over a hundred thousand dollars and, over a thousand people mobilized along the road. And it really was, it was a moment where you recognize that so many people were feeling helpless, like I had been, and that running and getting involved in this way was a really powerful way to, to do something. So, so amazing there. And congratulations to you. I mean, that is no, no small feat there, any part of that and to raise that much money. And at that point, you know, did you kind of, you know, having struggled again, going back to having struggled with depression was, um, you know, there's probably a big part of you that struggles with self-confidence, especially with how Harlem run, um, had taken a while to get moving. Did any part of you step back at that point and think, wow, you know, you, as you said, there's a team involved, but you were the brains, you were the kind of the, the one leading the charge. Did you allow yourself to reflect on that and say, look what I just did? Yeah. You know, Tina, it's, it's crazy because I also, um, I also still very much have imposter syndrome with, Mm -hmm. which I think, 
a lot of women, a lot of people grapple with, but I think women in particular. So there are moments definitely throughout that experience. I was like, Oh my God, like these people, people were like, Oh my God, it's Allison. Mm -hmm. As if I'm like Beyonce, right. That was my Beyonce moment. But I was like, Whoa, this, this is an idea. Like it came from my head to another person. And then we put it in motion. Um, but I, so I have that, that period of reflecting like, Oh my God, I can't believe I did this. And then on the other piece is like, am I the right person for this? Like, am I going to mess this up? When's the other shoe going to drop? Right. So yeah. it's, it's very much. Um, and I think again, when people, people always tell me like, I look so confident in this and this and that, but there's still a lot of little voices in my head saying, uh, maybe you can't do this. Maybe you're, you're overextending yourself, you know? So it's, it's, it's still very much a, a part of me. Friends, I have a very, very exciting announcement for you today. I have a brand new sponsor to introduce you to, but not only that, this sponsor has decided to partner with me for the rest of the year. Now, by now, you know me and hopefully you know that for me to commit to working with a brand, I have to believe in them and I have to feel good about not only their products, but their heart. And I know that sounds silly, the heart of a brand, but it's true. I want to see a culture I can believe in, a mission that means something. And who is Tracksmith, you ask? Well, Tracksmith is a Boston-based brand that is led by a group of runners who are committed to making classically stylish, cutting-edge apparel. Their goal is simple. Craft the most considered product on the market for runners, dedicated to the personal pursuit of excellence. And no, that does not just mean elites, sub-elites, or even those you may consider elites in your mind, like those who crush their Boston qualifier races or the place at your local races. This is for everyone, all of us. And Tracksmith calls these athletes amateurs in the most traditional sense of the term. The word amateur comes from the Latin word for lover, and we're all amateurs in that sense. This love reveals itself in special ways, in early morning sessions squeezed in before work, in the weekends structured around long runs, and in future vacations planned for goal races. Hello, Disney World. (laughs) It is a demanding lifestyle and one that requires gear that can handle the commitment. For me, gear that can handle lots of tough treatment, like being stuffed in a bag for a few hours immediately after runs, or those runs that are really long weekend after weekend, that's important. I used to be an H&M girl until I realized I was purchasing new products every few months because the quality was so bad. And I'm not talking about running products, obviously. I'm talking about just general casual stuff. As runners, we need clothes that can last, whether that's a breathable long sleeve shirt that can be reworn without washing after several runs or the perfect shorts for your long run with room for your keys, phone and fuel. Tracksmith designers sweat the details. That also means they work with the finest materials, from merino wool in their training tops to a unique nylon knit sourced from the best Italian mills for their running shorts. And all their garments feature details that let you focus on the things that matter. During these chilly mornings we are cherishing before the humidity and heat starts to catch up with us, I am absolutely loving the Harrier long sleeve. It keeps you warm when the run starts brisk and it cools you down as things heat up. It's moisture wicking, it dries in a flash and best of all it resists odours even if you wear yours around the clock. Or am I the only one who finds a few things you really need to get done before you jump in the shower post run? To welcome listeners to the podcast, Tracksmith is offering 15% off your first purchase. To learn more, visit tracksmith.com forward slash Tina Muir and enter code Tina. That's tracksmith.com forward slash Tina Muir. Enter code Tina, T-R-A-C-K-S-M-I-T-H dot com forward slash Tina Muir, T-I-N-A-M-U-I-R. So I have that, that period of reflecting like, Oh my God, I can't believe I did this. And then on the other piece is like, am I the right person for this? Like, am I going to mess this up? When's the other shoe going to drop? Right. So it's, it's very much. Um, and I think again, when people, people always tell me like, I look so confident in this and this and that, but there's still a lot of little voices in my head saying, uh, maybe you can't do this. Maybe you're, you're overextending yourself, you know? So it's, it's, it's still very much a, a part of me. I think that's so brave of you to say that and, and good that you say that because I think you are a good example and, and I'm also another good example that people see and they think that, um, you know, we we are doing things, we are kind of not in the spotlight in the sense of like, a, you know, a, a very, on a very small scale, right. um, but 
thinking that, oh, they must be so happy and confident and strong and and, and no, it's, that's not always the case. And so it, I right. think that is, you know, refreshing for people to hear you say that. And, um, and, and actually, I remember I told you before we started talking that um, I... I was a uh, I was doing a podcast at the Run Center before mm. you were on a panel with Ali Ali Feller um the next hour and I remember afterwards people being like you know I was like oh who is who is you know I knew who some of the people were but I was like oh who are they and people mentioned you like oh that's Alison Desir and I was like so who and um <laughs> and no offense to you but I but people were like oh you don't know who that is like it, it was kind of I felt a bit like stupid because I didn't Dina. know who you were and um, <laughs> so um I definitely I saw oh, that that day them. where I was I felt like I was like out of the loop because I didn't I didn't know who you were so um and I remember specifically feeling that way like how did I miss her but, oh. um yeah so you I I saw that side of you too thanks friends (laughs) (laughs) um so the global uh woman run collective um was the kind of next thing that came along yes empowering women who are not given a seat at the table tell us what is what does that mean yeah so global women run collective I feel like is really the culmination of my experience in running now um in the running industry I guess I would say uh for the past seven years and recognizing that um, many times the leaders were all men, white men in run, cru- run crews, run clubs. A lot of the, the leaders are men. And there were, uh, it always seemed like there were these conversations that were happening that I was left out of mm-hmm. or that other women were left out of. And, you know, going to industry conferences and recognizing that I was one of the only women, one of the only women of color and just feeling like, wait a second, but don't we, when we show up to races, isn't, aren't 60% of the field women. And yet we're not in these roles. Right. And, and somehow like the run other running leaders, it's all, all men talking to each other and sort of we're pulled in at the last minute. So funny. It actually, the day that I wrote the email about the global women run collective, I wrote it at 10 AM, um, on the same day that my son was born, my born, my mm-hmm. son was born that, that afternoon. So it must've been like, I had just gotten to a point where I got to get these things out of yeah. me. But I had reached out to my friend um, Huyen in Berlin, who's a member of the steering committee. And I said to her, I was like, why, like, why isn't there a network just of run crew and run co- club leaders, right? It was, a, it was a much smaller idea, but why isn't there a network of us where when we want to host events, we reach out to each other and we, we support each other's stuff. And we go to brands together and say that this is what we want, rather than sort of being the last people to be part of the conversation. So that was the idea that we worked together to create a network for women in running, to amplify our events, um, to sort of help establish new leaders, to even be uh, a touch base point when a brand approaches you or when an opportunity comes to you. You can reach out to another woman and say, what was this like for you? Like, how much should I ask for? What is this process even like? Um, and so that that's how it started. And our first event was around the New York City Marathon. And we had a panel that featured Sally Burgesson, the CEO of yeah. Wazel, who I love. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, Martha Garcia, who is the director of global brand communications at Hoka One One. Um, Huyen, who I mentioned, and Caitlin Phillips, who's actually, she's uh, running in the Olympic trials this weekend. And the panel centered on how can we create a space that is women above brand, right? Like brand and uh, brands are super important, of course, and Sally has her own brand, right? But but can we connect with each other on a higher level and realize that all the systems and inside of running have an effect on running, right? Yeah. So sexism, yeah. uh, racism, um, white supremacy, all of those things are acting within the running <laughs> space as well. So how can we work together to create a community and a space where we can talk about things and and sort of improve the state of running? And it just so happens that it's an amazing time to be a woman in running because these are the conversations that were happening. Yeah. Same weekend I saw Lauren Fleshman and Alicia Montano speak about the same things. And I was like, Oh my God, like this is, this is happening everywhere. Mm-hmm. Right. So, um, I guess there, like, I like to say there's like, there's something in the water or like Lauren Fleshman said, you get to a stage where you're just like, get <laughs> right. And I'm sorry for cursing. Um, but, and you realize, I, I got to say something like yeah, I got to yeah, do yeah. something, yeah. you know, and you yourself, you're part of this, right? So mm-hmm. it's just, it feels, it feels really good that we have this moment. Yeah. 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 And, and and it's, it's funny sometimes when I, when I look at my podcast guests for this year, or, I mean, I've had almost all women on my show Amazing. And, I keep, and I get to a point where I have to think, okay, I need to insert a man's episode in here. Cause it's been like, <laughs> 10 in a row of women or something but then I'm like 
But you know what? Like right now, there is so much going on, so much actually changes, like massive, these women who are doing things that are just changing the world. Like how can I not feature them um, just, you know, because I you know, I feel I need to balance things out when we right. know, you know, in a lot of ways, things have been very unbalanced for a long time. But right. um, so, yeah, I, sometimes I feel like, oh, I need to, you know, I need to kind of tone myself down a notch mm. and um, stop talking about all this stuff that's, you know. But isn't not- it, it, that's how we're socialized, right? Yeah. Like yeah. you're getting too big. You're taking up too much space. I say the same thing. Sometimes I'm like, oh my God, like, am I becoming that person? And I'm like, <laughs> what's wrong with that person? Right? Yeah. Like, this is, this is our time. And what we're saying isn't crazy. It's not unjustified. It's shining light on what, what needs to be said. But mm-hmm. I, I get that too. Sometimes I want to just be like, okay, Alison, just don't say anything. Mm-hmm. Just like, don't crawl into that little hole. Yeah. You know? yeah. 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 No, I doubt. I definitely feel that way. And, and, you know, for me, it'd be like, oh, you know, I should just go back to, to talking about elite runners and how they're getting ready for their next race. Right. Cause, Cause that's, you know, nice and safe. And, right. <laughs> but like, right. for me, that's not, I, I like, learning about people who are, you know, taking a stand and, and, and standing up for what they believe in and, and making a difference. So, um, yeah, uh, not that oh, runners don't make a difference, but it's a different kind of way. Right. Um, all right. So for other women listening or, or, or men perhaps too, that want to help with this and see, you know, there's a lot of good men out there, um, who genuinely, like you said, your husband, my husband definitely as well. And, um, they, they believe in women. They want to see things fair for women. They want to be better and improve. What about men listening or women within their own communities? How can they also do the same and empower other women? You said, you know, not given a seat at the table, but yeah. what can they do to within their own communities? Yeah, no, that's a really great question. And I would also say, um, uh, you know, this question also applies. Well, one thing that the Global Women Run Collective really tries to focus on, and the reason why we use the X is because we use that to be inclusive of uh, trans women and yeah. women of color who are often left out of the conversation. Okay. Many times we're talking about women in running and what we're really talking about is white women, right? Mm-hmm. So, and I think, so what I think um, people of the majority, white women, um, men, what, what people can do is really bring other people into the room. And so I want to say for you, Tina, for example, for you to pull me into your podcast and give me this platform and this stage is massive. Sally Burgesson and Mary Wittenberg, they're like my fairy godmothers, right? Like <laughs> they really are ally, allies in that. I know that they're always in the in rooms that I will never get access to saying my name and saying, let's bring her into the room, right? And that's what men can do also. Hi friends, I just want to take a quick moment to let you know about a giveaway I am offering right now. Uh, This is not a paid ad. This is just me, Tina, uh, jumping on to just tell you, you know, I am thankful for Ultra for their support of me during my pregnancy year. They don't see that as a hindrance. They don't see it as something that they need to stay away from. They are supporting me through my pregnancy and I'm so thankful for that. But not only are they supporting me, every month this year, Ultra is giving away a free pair of shoes to one of my listeners. You can go to the website, you can choose any pair of shoes you like from their website and you can order it and it'll come to you free. And once you enter once into this giveaway, you will be entered every month for the rest of the year. So the earlier you enter, the more chances you have to win and um, the less people there are that could win. Uh, Unfortunately, it is just a US only giveaway. I did do that first month was worldwide. So the rest of it is going to be just for the US because there's a lot of complications that come with ordering uh, some shoes to a different country uh, when it comes to products. So uh, I want to thank Ultra for this. And if you haven't given them a try, this is you know a great opportunity to, to set yourself up to see if you can win some, although I would definitely recommend going out to get some of your own. And actually on that note, I've had quite a lot of questions as to which ones I like the most. The Escalante there's two versions of that. There's the Escalante and the Escalante Racer. Um, I love both of those shoes. The Escalante is more of a daily shoe. The Escalante Racer is good for racing. So if you're looking for a racing shoe, Escalante Racer is what I would be 
suggesting to you. I also love the Torin, but my favorite shoe, I think, is the Ultra Cayenta. Um, I really enjoy those ones. And um, so those are my three favorites if you are curious. So how do you enter this giveaway? You can go to tinamuir.com forward slash ultra. That's A-L-T-R-A tinamuir.com forward slash ultra to enter to win this giveaway and as long as you don't remove your email from the list you will be entered every month for the rest of the year so go do it i know that they're always in the in rooms that i will never get access to saying my name and saying let's bring her into the room right and that's what men can do also men can look around and say, wait a second, like it's a bunch of just white men in this space, or it's just a bunch of men in this space. Aren't there other voices that we can bring in here? And they can amplify what we say, because many times what we say <laughs> is not listened to, the wind. right? <laughs> exactly. Yeah. So, and, and my husband, my husband also has an incredible story. Um, but my husband is, is so good at, at just, you know, making sure that I'm amplified, that I get an opportunity that, even though I'm, I'm at home with my son and working at home, but that I have, I still have the opportunity to flourish. So, and, and this goes for me too, when I think about folks with, um, even more marginalized identities, right? Like non-binary folks or people in the LGBT community, how can I be sure that I'm saying their names and creating space for them? Um, it's work that we, that we all have to do. Yes. Thank you for that. Um, and I just want to add there that for someone listening, you know, uh, particularly for the, the men listening, like maybe, you know, it doesn't have to come in the the way of like, you know, you're in a meeting and you say, hey, you know, right. Sam, what do you think? Um, but you could also, you know, maybe you have a, a wife or a sister or a, um, a niece or whatever in your life who is really good at something, but they, like we've said about women not having confidence, maybe they don't have confidence. Maybe you, you give them that support, that kind of encouragement of, Hey, you know, what if you made this into a little Etsy shop, you know, Mm -hmm. something that they could do that is their own, especially if they're a mother and they, you know, you are the one out working and they are at home. Um, think about, see if you can encourage them to kind of, you know, pursue something that, that brings them joy and is, is their own, not just involved in being a mother um because you know it doesn't have to end up being a career or or even bring in any money but something that they can do for themselves that will empower them and let them see that they do have stuff to offer the world so just wanted to add that in there exactly um okay so you have you were given the nickname powdered feet which i absolutely love yeah. uh, which yeah. describes person uh, so active you never see them just the footprints of where they've been yes um, I, lo- I love that so we've already kind of covered that that what you're doing is a lot in addition yeah. to being a mum to Corey, who I cannot stop staring at because he's just so adorable. Um, and he just, every time you talk, he just looks and stares at you. It's so cute. Thank you. Um, <laughs> but, you know, we've mentioned about you struggling with imposter syndrome, self-confidence. Um, do, do you ever see it as kind of, okay, um, do you ever wonder, and I ask this because I'm very much that person as well, am I just doing this because I don't feel confident enough in myself to be still? That I feel like I need to fill my life with things of being successful and achieving and going to get things because I don't feel like I'm enough, even though I, I should do. Do you do you struggle with that? Yes, Tina, that is like such a like such a great question because one of my really great mentors and friends um, she said that to me one day, she said, you know, you're enough. Even if you weren't doing any of this stuff, you are enough. Do you believe that? And I was like, I don't know. <laughs> right? I think that's something because I, I really am like the, the nickname my father gave me from a very young age. I've always been really like, quote unquote, high achieving and wanting to do stuff. Um, but I do struggle with being quiet and, and, um, and being, or being still rather than being quiet. So I think, you know, I think it's sort of like one of those, I think it's like, um, a personality trait that could go both ways. Right. And I don't, and, and sometimes it's working. It, sometimes it's that I really am, I really am focused on my why. And that really is it. And other times I'm like, maybe I'm really just trying to continue to prove to myself, yeah. um, that I can do things. So, you know, I think it's, it's very complex and, and why it's such a brilliant question is because it really allows me to like be vulnerable and break down and say, like, I don't have it all figured out all the time. Yes. Um, so it's, it's a lot of being motivated by my why and knowing that I have the, the power and the privilege to do things. And then there's a little bit about like, I probably need to keep proving to myself. 
Yeah. Yeah. And I think that's, that's kind of, you know, natural for us to want to, to keep challenging ourselves. Challenging myself is the kind of phrase I use that I know is probably not what's actually going on, but it's <laughs> a positive word that I can kind of spin to make yes. it sound like that's what I'm doing. But yeah, I get what you're saying. And then with that, do you, you know, you keep doing these things that being, you know, huge successes, making big differences. Does any part of you feel pressure to kind of keep one upping yourself? So that is something that I also have thought about. And I think, you know, um, obviously I'm a new mom, but before Corey, I would say there was more of that. Now I really think when I'm doing stuff and this may sound cliche, I'm really like, wow, Corey is going to be 35 one day, like 34, 35. Like I am Corey's going to live in this world. And so it's made me think even more deeply about the environment and of yes. course gun control. And then about gender parity. Cause I'm like, he's going to be a grown up in this world. And like, I really got to do what I can. I and my friends and my community and my support system, we got to really selfishly do better because my son is going to live in this world and I'm not always going to be here, you know? So I think it's a bit more, um, it's more like what it, like, can I use my, like, again, power and privilege to just make sure that my son is okay. You know, it's not necessarily about one upping myself. It's like, I gotta, I can't sit around while honestly the world falls apart. Yeah, no, I feel you. And people know on this podcast that I Definitely talks about environmental stuff a lot and that being the key thing that I think about Bailey having to, you know, turning around to me someday and saying, Mum, why didn't you do anything? Like yep. so, um, you know, um, I definitely, yeah, definitely where were you when this was happening, you yeah. know? Yeah, exactly. So talk let's talk about being a new mum. How mm-hmm. has life changed um, you know, as you transition into life with your work and with Corey? Um, mm-hmm. how are you how are you handling it and how has th- how have things been different? Mm -hmm. So I would say that the first three or four months were very, very difficult. And the other piece that I haven't yet mentioned is that I went back to school and got my master's in counseling psychology and, Mm -hmm. and was, um, practicing therapy on my way to licensure. But one of the things that I had to stop was, um, that process because I've decided to stay home with my son and, and work from home and, and doing other things, not therapy. Um, so that's one big change, right? I never, I never thought that I was going to be again, one of those women that would give up their career <laughs> for their child. And I realized just like, what a disservice we do to people and women in particular, when we talk about being a stay at home mom or a mom, as if it's not like a career and a really important thing. Right. And so it's not hard. <laughs> right. Right. Exactly. So, and yes, I'm giving it up and but it's also, I'm, I'm so thankful that I have this little person. So it's, it's, it's really complicated. The first three months. Um, and I mentioned the thing about therapists because I, I very much knew that postpartum anxiety and postpartum depression was a thing, but I somehow felt because I knew about it and I'd seen clients, um, struggling with it, that it would stop me from having it. But I, I had it, I had it really bad. I was crying almost every day. Um, there were times when I wanted to, you know, just like walk out of the house and like not come back. Not because I wanted to leave my son or my, my partner, but I just wanted to be free Mm -hmm. again, you know? Mm -hmm. Um, and he was so small. He was like five pounds, 14 ounces. I had an emergency C-section. So there was just so much like trauma, honestly, in how it happened so quickly. And suddenly he was here and, um, he was so needy as all children are, and yeah. you can't do what you want. And me and my husband are fighting over, cause I, every, every time my husband would hold him, I would imagine that he would drop him and his head would smash into a million pieces. Like all of these very graphic intrusive thoughts, um, that I was having. And he's looking at me now <laughs> and, uh, I'm thankful that I'm, I'm, I'm out of the, the thick of things, right? Like it's not as bad as it was. Um, now it's just about, recognizing that my time is very limited. It's very valuable. And that when I'm doing things like podcasts or, or working or having conference calls, you know what, my son is going to be in it, right? Because childcare is very expensive and this is my job right now. Mm-hmm. So, um, maybe the folks that I'm working with, I don't know how they feel about it, but this is, it's just my new reality. You're going to hear squeaks and screams and I'm going to say, oop, I got to go. My, my son just pooped. And, mm-hmm. um, and then with my husband, my husband chips in as, uh, as much as he can, he's working full time. And how do we both manage travel? It's a lot of, I, like I say, I was really living fully before. And now I feel like all my life is planned, yeah. but it's, it's also great and beautiful. Um, but it's, you know, 
we're yeah. on a schedule always. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> no, and thank you for being honest about that stuff because I think that is kind of something that that we all do go through. Um, but you don't hear about it too much because mm-hmm. it's it's just not how it's supposed to be, right? It's supposed right. to be, you know, the pictures That's online that people I'm so in love with my baby and yes. um, you know, just loving being a parent. And and you you can be loving being a parent while at the same time. Um I've spoken a lot about kind of that longing for when I can um have that time to um really work. Like I um mm-hmm. I spoke about on my birthday last year when my husband said, What do you want to do today? And uh, Honestly, a part of me said, nearly said, can I go in my room for a minute or for a few hours and just do some work? Because I genuinely like enjoy what I do. Um, yes. But then I had this like guilt of like, you can't spend part of your birthday doing work. Um, so there's, yeah, a part of me that looks forward to a time when I can, I can put in like a six hour day or an eight hour oh day God. of getting, I you know. Say, yeah, sorry, <laughs> so, go on. Yeah. I definitely feel you. And I think a lot of people do maybe not necessarily that, especially if your job wasn't something that, you know, particularly lit your heart on fire, but there, there's, there's something that you miss. Maybe it's being able to get out and exercise. Maybe it's being able to watch a TV show without being interrupted, whatever it may be. Mm -hmm. Um, I think it's good that you can mention stuff like that. And you are very honest about your struggles, um, which I really admire. And, and yeah, I do yeah. kick myself for not figuring out who you were earlier. Um, <laughs> <laughs> but, um, you know, I, I've i always said the same thing. I think it's very important to, to share what you're feeling, to talk about these things that you're struggling with, because not only are you making the whole premise behind this podcast is not feeling alone. And not mm-hmm. only by sharing are you showing people that they're not alone, but it also, I see it as a strength. Um, I was in the gym the other day and the owner said to me, um, he reads my email newsletter once a week and he said, you're very in your own head. And I was like, I, I don't know if that's a compliment, but to me, I see that as a strength because I'm getting it out of my head, not mm-hmm. letting it like fester away. Um, mm-hmm. But, you know, for someone who's thinking it, it's too painful to open up Pandora's box and and mm. start sharing these things that are painful and 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 raw to me, um, what would you say to that person? Mm -hmm. You know, I would say that we have a tendency to shy away from things that are raw and are painful. And, but as a result, they, they build up and they become even more painful. Right. So it's sort of, it's counterintuitive. You're like, no, but I don't want to share because then I have to face it, but not facing it creates much longer wounds inside of you. Mm -hmm. And, and, and an amazing thing about sharing, and I think that really is, um, what, what is the undercurrent for everything that I've done is that when you share other people share and you connect and create community. And I, and I don't mean it doesn't have to be a hundred. I mean, community, even in, within that one person who can understand you. Um, but the truth is it is painful, right? Like it's not like you share and all of a sudden things are better, but, but, but I think increasing your tolerance for, pain and discomfort in this way is important because that's what, that's, that's how you move through things. Mm -hmm. You know, Mm -hmm. um, unfortunately I wish we could just lock things away and and they actually get better, but we, we know that's not the case. We know that they just fester and then, um, they, they come out in ways that you wouldn't expect, right? All of a sudden you're unable to work. Your relationships are falling apart. Um, things just get worse. So it's hard. This work is hard. Life is, life is difficult. Mm -hmm. You know, that's Mm -hmm. the truth of it. Yeah. Well, thank you for, for being someone who is leading the charge and, you know, you can see that other people are learning from you and and doing the same based on, um, you know, seeing you being brave enough to share. So thank you for your part in, in helping to get people to open up as well. And I just want to kind of, um, wrap up here with, uh, talking about, um, kind of, you mentioned earlier that I'm a part of this kind of movement and, um, Mm -hmm. both of us were mentioned in a runner's world article when, um, it was announced about Alicia and I, um, signing with ultra pregnant, but they also, the article, Elizabeth Carey, wonderful writer, wrote it. Um, and she said about other people who, um, had been kind of brought on in non-traditional kind of sponsorship ways. Um, you know, yourself, uh, with Hoka, um, Myrna Valerio with Merrill, and obviously everyone kind of knows Wazel has been very prominent in what they've been doing. Um, yes. but you came in, you're now the global athlete ambassador for just starting off from the basics. What does, what does that mean for someone who's, you know, seen that term and not really know what it means? Yeah. So, um, Hoka has, has given me an incredible opportunity to really 
support my dreams. And, um, so that being said, it's, 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 and so I've, I've been sponsored before and this is a unique opportunity and that Hoka really recognized the impact that I was making and the way that I was reaching communities that they may not other have otherwise have access to. And they said to me, we want to support you in what you're doing. So there's no agenda coming from their end. Obviously they make amazing, comfortable shoes. And, and that's also really important to me because now that I'm postpartum 30 pounds heavier and those pounds don't seem to be going anywhere <laughs> and my hips and my knees and everything is, is different having an incredibly, um, cushioned shoe is important. So they make great product, but they're invested in supporting me in my work with, um, mental health and activism. So the first piece of that I actually launched yesterday is a national tour focusing on movement and mental health. Um, the aim is to normalize the conversation around mental health and give people tools and coping mechanisms, um, to grapple with sort of everyday struggles that we have. Mm -hmm. So it's kicking off in New York, March 28th, and we'll be going to Austin, Texas, Boston, Massachusetts, um, Detroit, Michigan, and Santa Cruz, California, bringing movement and mental health to those communities. So as a global athlete ambassador, I represent the brand and I get the support to continue to touch and engage with uh, the communities that I work with. Yeah, so cool. Thank you so much for, for sharing yeah. that. And that's just amazing that Hoka is doing that. And, you know, I mentioned all the brands that have kind of taken a stand so far. Um, by the time this comes out, maybe there'll be more. Um, mm -hmm. But you know, those, those brands, um, taking on working with people, supporting them and what they're kind of, um, really making a difference in, uh, that is not necessarily to related to running and performance, but running to make the world a better place. Yes. What is What do you think that says about these brands and, and why aren't all the other brands kind of following suit? Do you think? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I have to say one, one thing, I think that there's this, the sort of obviously elites are incredible and I believe that elites will always be supported. They, uh, to, if we're being honest, they could use more support as well, right? There's yeah, controversy sure. there, but we're not in competition with elites. The one thing about the world is that there is plenty of money and these brands do generate millions of dollars. Mm -hmm. And it is, I believe it's the brand's responsibility to put money around people making a difference people. And you could be making a difference because you're achieving and you're, and you're going very fast or like you say, um, that you're changing the world. And I think brands are just honestly afraid things have been done a certain way for a very long time. Mm -hmm. Um, if you make a political stance or if you, if you get behind folks who are doing things differently, how might that affect, um, the dollars and cents? Um, if you're supporting these people, who's gonna, you know, I always laugh when people post on, um, Instagram, like, unsubscribe, like unfollow, right? Like when brands take a stand. Um, so I think there's a lot of fear about, uh, what that will look like. But the truth is if you're not saying something, if you're not taking a stand, you're also saying something, yeah. right? So, um, I'm thankful for brands like Hoka, like ultra, like Solomon, like, you know, Merrill, that are at the forefront of this. But I do believe that this is, this is the only way for brands and forget just brands, corporations, companies will be able to survive moving forward. Mm -hmm. You have to take a stand on things that are important. And that means that certain people are no longer going to support you until they themselves come around. Yeah. Right. Um, yeah. Yeah. No, thank you for that. And, and I just wanted to hear your, your thoughts on that as, as someone else who has been supported and, um, I didn't want people to think I just kept bringing it back to ultra because there are other brands out there doing, doing mm -hmm. it as well. And, um, you know, I loved seeing the response of that, that article that Elizabeth wrote and just the news, yes. um, how many people just kind of said, you know, wow, I'm going to go buy those shoes. Uh, yes. or I'm going to go buy that product just because I want to support them. So really, yes. really cool there. Um, and, okay. and I, I want to say one more thing, Tina, yeah. just seeing, seeing you and Alicia, I mean, it's just like, it, it's, it's, it was so incredibly validating for me because I remember when I was pregnant, I was like, oh my God, like my life is over, <laughs> right? I was so happy, but I was like, my life is over. Now I have to be this inside person. I, I, you know, nobody's going to care about me. All these opportunities are just going to pass me by and seeing you pregnant and Alicia pregnant and kicking butt and mm -hmm. still being public. I'm like, oh my God, there's many ways to be a woman. There's yeah. many ways to experience pregnancy, yeah, you know? Yeah. For sure. I think that before it was kind of a thing of, uh, even, uh, you know, elite running is, is, is a different game. Like people, you know, right. that was kind of a, a death, uh, like a, a death sentence as I've heard it uh, yes. called, um, because 
you know, people thought you were kind of done when you did that. But even for, for everyone else, Regular it was kind folks. of like, okay, I'm going to put my my life on pause for five years. Yes. And then I'll, when I, when my kids are in school, then I can pick back up yes. or find my way back. Um, right. So yeah, I love that things are changing now and it's not kind of seen as this kind of, yeah, just punishment. And watching Alicia, like, you know, getting on with stuff at, at the time, 37 weeks pregnant, just for me, gave me a kick up the butt to like, wow, you know, if she can do this now, then, you know, I can achieve a lot in the, in the time that I have left. So um, yeah, really cool. All right. So what would you like to say just to wrap up here to anyone listening who is inspired by you, who has heard us talking about, you know, these things and and how we can make a difference, Mm -hmm. um, but they feel like, I don't have lots of followers. I don't have um, a big platform. I don't know Sally Bergeson, um, mm-hmm. whatever it may be. Like they feel, what difference do I make? I'm one person and I have 120 followers on Instagram. Like how's that going to, why, why would I, why would I do that when I, you know, I'll leave it to you guys with your big platforms. Right. Well, what I'll say is that just a mere seven years ago, I was that person and I still very much feel like I'm that person. Like, I mean, I'm not naive. I recognize I've gotten a lot of, a lot of attention, right? But there's always going to be somebody who has more, but what you have is your voice and you have the folks around you. So your influence doesn't have to be massive. Your influence could just be like, you live in a town that's, um, um, part of a red state and, and you recognize the important, you know, that your friend group, um, would vote blue and, but they have obstacles of getting to, um, to vote, right? Why not organize a caravan to get everybody out to vote for the election? Mm-hmm. Um, you have the power to, and uh, elections very much on my mind because it's, you know, it's, it's an election year, but you have the power to canvas or you have the power to make phone calls or you have the power to, after hearing about somebody talk about their mental health struggle, recognize that your sister is struggling and you can get them help. I think we really downplay these small moments, yeah. but it's a, accumulation of these small moments that make the bigger moments. And and, and I think, you know, just, just give yourself a chance, you know, before you say, I can't do it, allow yourself the opportunity to try. Yeah. I love that so much. Thank you. I've, I've honestly, because I can't vote because I'm British. I Mm. have honestly like a few times been like, I wonder how I could like stand outside a polling booth and be like, Hey, I'll watch your kids while you go vote. Or like, Mm-hmm. Somehow, like anyone who wants to vote, but you know, can't find childcare. Like, can I come, like, look after your kids for an hour? Yeah, <laughs> like, like yeah. and I, I, mean, I don't. You I, have so much on your plate, but but it's true. Like, imagine how helpful that is, right? Yeah. Like, that is a true obstacle. Mm-hmm. If I had to vote today, I'd be like, it's not happening unless my husband gets home at a certain time, right? Mm-hmm. And then I'm like a perfectly good voter whose vote was lost. Yeah. yeah. So yeah, there's like such important things that that each of us can do, and. Mm-hmm. I hope that, um, yeah, give yourself a chance. Yeah. Thank you so much. All right. Where can people find out more about you? I will put lots of links in the show notes because Alison is a busy, busy lady and has done a lot. Um, but for the general, if they just want to follow you, find you, where, where should they go? Yes. So you can go to my website, which is Alison, A-L-I-S-O-N as in Nancy, M as in Mary, Desir, D-E-S-I-R.com, Allison M. Desir.com. And all of my social handles are that. So Allison M. Desir on Instagram, on Twitter, on Facebook. And from there, you can get linked to all the things. Okay, great. <laughs> all right. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Corey, who is now asleep. Oh, yeah. I genuinely didn't think that was going to happen. I, I, I was I'm amazed too. we managed this, but <laughs> thank you so much for your time and for just being who you are and uh, changing the world. Cause you really, I know I can't be the one to say it, like to make you believe it, but you, you really are. So I hope thank that you, continues Tina. to sink into your brain as well. Thank you so much for the time. My friends, if you have a minute and you could leave a review on your favorite podcast player, Apple Podcasts, aka iTunes, Stitcher, Overcast, Pocket Class, Spotify, or whatever else podcast player you use to listen to this podcast, or if you would subscribe to this podcast, you will help me get out in front of new runners to make our tribe even bigger and even better. It might not seem like you as one person can make a difference, but really it helps a lot. And it shows me you appreciate the hard work I put in for those. Thank you so much. She is awesome. And Corey is obviously awesome for 
staying still and keeping put and quiet during that interview. I can't believe we actually managed that. That's so impressive. I will put links, lots of links in the show notes to go find Alison, Harlem Run, Run for All Women, Global Women Run Collective, those three plus the website of hers she mentioned and her social media channels. You can find all the links in the show notes at tinamuir.com forward slash episode 181. And I just want to take another moment to thank Athletic Greens and John G for sponsoring this episode. Uh, you can find Athletic Greens by going to athleticgreens.com forward slash Tina to get yourself a free $79 value travel pack with 20 servings. And you can go to uh, tinamuir.com forward slash Janji to get yourself a special deal on their bestseller shorts. So be sure to go check that out. Now, next week we have Anna Frost on the show. Anna is probably one of the, the considered one of the best uh, ultra and trail runners out there. She just recently had um, her daughter and we're kind of talking about that transition to motherhood, but also uh, spending a lot of time on, on what she's accomplished and, and how she was kind of in that first wave of real professional trail runners and how life was affected by them once sponsors kind of came into the into the situation and they had kind of obligations that they had to meet and how social media affected things um, and how it really, you know, damaged her in a lot of ways. And she eventually had to completely pull away from everything just to find her running again. So I think a lot of this conversation will really resonate with you. And um, Anna talking about this is a big part of why I wanted to bring her on the show. So be sure to subscribe if you haven't already so you can go get that. And my friends, have a great week. I will see you then. Thanks for listening to the Running For Real podcast. Be sure to check out tinamuir.com for show notes and even more helpful running information.